And Berna, if you would go ahead and introduce everyone, we want to just welcome you and say thank you for doing this. Well, it's wonderful to be here. Judy, thank you so much. Judy and I met quite a few years ago, and it's, it's an honor to be back. And I wanted to introduce to you Judy Holstein, who you will see in the film. Judy is a drama therapist, and she's worked with every population, um, including 18 years with people with um, Alzheimer's disease as a drama therapist. And Angel Duncan is the Director of Graduate and Art Therapy and Counseling, of, Counseling at Albertus Magnus College. And she's also had a long career in art therapy and counseling. And we're very honored that she's here. We also wanted to take special note to tell you that Mark Wortman, who in, was the CEO of Alzheimer's Disease International, he's here from Amsterdam. Um, he endorsed our film. Um, I'm holding it up. I don't know um, if you can see it, but you'll see it in a few minutes. And then there are quite a few other people who um, are here who help with the film. Uh, Penny Rothheiser, Sandy and Charles in Carvaya, uh, Wendy and John Heatner. And I wanted to thank all of you, including Wendy Miller, whose wonderful late husband, Gene Cohen, was an inspiration to this film too. So now um, we're, Angel is kind enough to show the uh, trailer and the film clips, and then um, the three of us will have a few words to share with you. Am I able to share the screen? It says, dis this says the host disabled participants. Oh, oh, no, you can't. Let me just, <laughs> okay. your co -host. Thank you. Sorry. That's okay. You're all set. Thank you. The people you see here at the museum, at the circus, or at a painting workshop, people who appear so together, so alive and focused, are in fact dealing with serious memory problems. They have lost many of their cognitive skills. They are living with Alzheimer's disease. Their involvement with the arts and other creative activities is now being recognized as a way to help bring them back into more active communication and a richer quality of life. Alzheimer's disease doesn't affect the entire brain all at once. It seems to selectively start in the parts of the brain that are important for laying down new memory. But there are parts of the brain that are involved uh, much later that are really involved in creativity. There's a part of the brain called the parietal lobe uh, that's involved in Alzheimer's but rather late. And that part of the brain is stimulated uh, through uh, creative activities uh, like art uh, and music. You bring a person who is suffering perhaps from Alzheimer's you put them in front of a painting. Somehow, the painting says something to them about its scale, about the color, about the vibrancy of the picture. Somehow, they begin to have a dialogue with the picture. Compared to her, the Mona Lisa is a shrew. Really? I think so. Anyway, she has a face you can't always trust. Well, she, she's got something. Innocence. Yes, innocence. We travel to some of the best residences and daycare centers in the United States and Western Europe, where the creative arts are integrated into the daily activities of the people living with Alzheimer's. We know that they take in and it translates in an Alzheimer person's brain to have some meaning. The creative arts are an avenue to tap into a nonverbal emotional place in a person. When they're given paint, markers, any kind of media for art making, and their hands are involved, and their muscles are involved, things are tapped in them that are genuine and active and alive 
So the creative arts bypass the limitations and they simply go to the strengths. People still have imaginations intact all the way to the very, very end of their progressive disease. I remember better what I face. It's about Alzheimer's disease, a growing global epidemic. And yet, it's a hopeful story showing how the creative arts can help renew a sense of connection and identity for people with Alzheimer's, our parents, our spouses, our friends, that they can no longer communicate as they did in the past. The project was created by Berna Heaper, whose mother was afflicted by Alzheimer's, but who found renewal through painting. The film is narrated by the Academy Award-winning actress Olivia de Havilland. My mother always loved art, of course, music, dance, the movies, paintings. And in fact, early to middle stage of Alzheimer's, she decided that she wanted to paint. So she got all the equipment and the canvas and the paint set and got the easel, set the easel, put the, the canvas on the easel and started to paint. And she loved oil. She loved the texture of oil. And, uh, and she, so she painted, and I think it brought her a peace of mind, and it helped her to relax. So many caregivers, so many people give up with this disease, and it's so important not to give up. I have a wonderful dear friend, Verna, whose mother was a famous painter, Hilgos, in Chicago, who loved to paint, and she painted throughout her illness. I first met Hilda in 1995 when I was consulting to uh, this nursing home where she was as a patient. And I was asked to see her because she had periods of agitation. She was uh, withdrawn at other times, not interacting with the staff, looked kind of apathetic. When I tried to interact with her, she kind of ignored me. It was as if I, I wasn't being recognized by her. One day I was just trying to think of, well, why isn't she herself? And is there anything that we could do to get her to connect again? And so she was just very sad and very quiet. And she knew she was not, not herself and, and not speaking the way she used to speak. And so I said to her one day, mom, do you want to paint? And her face brightened and she lit up a little bit and she seemed to be a little bit like herself. And she looked at me and she connected and she said, yeah, I remember better when I paint. It was a very exciting moment when I heard that. And I suggested to Hilda's daughter that she contact the Art Institute of Chicago and see if there might be some students who would be interested in working with Hilda. I started to go to the nursing home where she was living and I brought out paints and started to introduce her to the idea of painting again with the hopes that that might be of interest to her because she had told her daughter that she remembered better when she paints. And at first she actually acted as if she wasn't even hearing me and she would often sometimes turn away from me when I would be talking to her. And it gave me the impression that she was really shut down and that there was sort of a void of person there, especially because the people around me at the nursing home seemed to feel that either the lights were on or the lights were off, um, meaning that either you're capable of engaging or you're not capable. And they really believed that Hilda was not capable of engaging um, in, a, in a real deep, meaningful way. Finally, I, I think there was one day when I was really, really let down and I started to leave the nursing home and out of the corner of my eye I saw Hilda beckon me over and she had very long fingers and very pronounced fingers and she went like this to me and so I was like what is she doing and I went over to her and she said a full sentence for the first time to me she said I've never had anything like this, you know, let's just keep it this way. And I don't even know if I responded because I didn't really know what to say. I think I just looked at her and nodded. And then I was so hooked from then on. 
I knew that she was connected to me and I felt very loyal to her. She sort of came alive. I mean, there was more expression on her face. Uh, I was able to communicate a bit more with her. And Jenny and then uh, several other students uh, began coming to the nursing home and working with Hilda. She was really regaining a quality of life that she had started to lose when she was first entering into that nursing home. I mean, she would laugh. We had, she would actually make jokes to the involvement of Jenny, Jane, Tim, and Robin, Hilda created over 300 paintings, often doing several each week, covering the walls of her room and those of family and friends with her bright and joyful color. Then, in February of 1998, Hilda passed away. In her memory, Berners set up the Hilgos Foundation, awarding scholarships to students of the Art Institute of Chicago to work with people having memory problems. In spite of Alzheimer's, the essence of each person continues on, still ready to communicate, often through new paths, to touch and be touched, to love and be loved. Uh, thank you so much, um, and th thank you for organizing that, Angel. It's so nice of you. And thank you, Judy, again, for inviting us here today, um, inviting Judy and Angel and me. I, it's really an honor, and we're so thrilled that you were able to see some of the film clips um, of I Remember Better When I Paint. Now, those six words changed my mother's life, changed my life, and have become an education for, have helped educate so many different people. Um, my mother's six words were a catalyst for the project, which brings us here today, because it was my mother who guided me with her words of wisdom. In fact, it was through my, my, uh, mother, my own odyssey with my mother's experience with Alzheimer's that I was able to see how creativity changed her life and indeed might change the life of others. It always, and it always changes the way we look at memory impairment. I wanna tell you a little bit more about making the film. 
So um, a friend of mine who knew about my mother's story introduced me to a French filmmaker, Eric Elena, who cares about this topic. And when we met to discuss how we might tell, we met to discuss how we might tell this story through film. And after my big first meeting with him, I was late for lunch with someone I had met in Paris. And my lunch was with Olivia de Havilland, the great film star of Gone with the Wind, the winner of two Academy Awards for Best Actress. She had moved to Paris, and in fact, she still lives there. I had arrived breathlessly at the lunch and explained that I had, had I was late because I was at a meeting with a, co a possible co-director of a film I was hoping to do about Alzheimer's and the arts. And without even missing a beat, Olivia responded by asking, well, who is going to narrate that film? And I said that I had not even thought that far ahead. And her response was, well, I would like to narrate that film. And she explained that she had so many friends who had been affected by the disease that she would like to do whatever she could to be helpful in addressing the problem. So how I was, I was really uh, so lucky that um, I had uh, um, a film director, uh, a famous narrator, and I, I, I just was really uh, so pleased that all that had happened. Um, in addition to the narrator, as you see in the film, there are noted doctors, art students, Yasmin Aga Khan, president of Alzheimer's Disease uh, International, and Mark Wartman, as I mentioned, was here with, uh, with us too. He's the former CEO. And um, also, as we know, all know that Rita Hayworth had Alzheimer's. So both Mark and Yasmin Aga Khan were very helpful in making this film. I wanted to share a few other things that we are doing now to get the word out that the creative arts can help change the quality of life of people with Alzheimer's. Social media is very important in spreading the word. And we are active users of, of Twitter. We founded an Alls Chat, a weekly Twitter-driven chat on Mondays at 3 p.m. New York Eastern Standard Time, where Alzheimer ex caregivers and experts share a few dementia caregiving topics ex each week. And we have over 7,000 followers. So stay tuned on that if you're uh, interested. We've also been very lucky to have very good press. For instance, the Gerontologist magazine said, I remember better when I paint is perhaps the most important documentary to date dealing with our understanding of Alzheimer's. We've also entered film festivals, had screenings, but perhaps the widest exposure has been through showings on public television. Um, we were very fortunate that WTTW in Chicago agreed to sponsor the film and distribute it nationwide in the um, United States. So we never guessed how many um, broadcasts we would actually have, but recently we, it's up to over 4,000 uh, 4, separate showings on public television. The film also, this is the DVD, is also a DVD package and it had special programs describing how to do organizing an outing, a creative workshop, a special, um, a special feature with, Jean, with Dr. Jean Cohn, whom I mentioned, Wendy Miller is here, um, and also creating social bonds with people with Alzheimer's. We also tried to um, work out and intergenerational projects as well. And we have established in my mother's name, Hilgos, uh, an award that provides funding at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago that supports and encourages the artistic creation of people for mem with memory impairment. We encourage students who worked with my mother, um, who first worked with my mother to do just that. And we're spreading the word to younger students as Two, we, we have a short play uh, based on the concept that children will respond to a story if they participate in telling it. And so they tell the, also tell the story of Helgos and the students who painted with her. I, one other thing I wanted to say that one of the nurses whom we met in the film is Dorothy Seaman. And she also reappears in the book we have done. And she writes about how we help people with, um, with Alzheimer's. Are you Anna? Um, anyway, um, and as, as Dorothy did every day at the VA hospital in Chicago, Dorothy Seaman adds an important um, thought in the story when, when she writes, 
I think that I think our health education does not begin to teach the potential for the sacred spiritual relationship that can and should exist. Much of the real comfort and healing that needs to be done is in the is in the context of listening with the ears of our heart. Listening with the ears of our heart sums up beautifully the entire project. In retrospect, that was what I was doing, listening with the ears of my heart. When I asked my mother if she wanted to start painting again, she gave me the answer that caught my attention. Welcome, David. Inspired my attention and then later became the title of the film, Book and Play. I remember better when I paint. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, um, as I had mentioned, I was going to introduce Judy Holstein, who's a drama therapist, and she's worked with every population, including 18 years of working with people with Alzheimer's disease. So Judy, um, it's your turn. Judy, take it away. Hi, folks. When words alone are not enough, art involves emotions and emotions drive the mind, the person's mental health. These are words of my mentor, Marilyn Toddy Richmond, one of the founders of the National Association for Drama Therapy, uh, now called North American Drama Therapy Association. And the therapy experience uses both the body and the mind, and it works to heal or strengthen the whole person. The therapist can assess the individual and together they identify which modality shows the greatest potential to engage multiple senses and activate many areas of the brain in the journey that will lead to self-expression, self-awareness, and a process of healing. This is done with people of all ages with a broad range of physical, emotional, and cognitive needs. Um, the Institute for Therapy Through the Arts, for example, is a program in Evanston. They offer art, music, dance movement, and drama therapy, and has adapted the therapeutic methods currently in this pandemic crisis to utilize the phone and the internet to engage hundreds of clients to address their individual needs. ITA is finding ways to engage multiple senses and activate many areas of the brain. Uh, and this includes people with Alzheimer's. I'm going to talk now more specifically about drama therapy in relation to using that method with people with Alzheimer's. The human capacity for creativity and spontaneity can be tapped through all of the modalities that we've mentioned, dance movement, music, art, and drama, regardless of the stage of Alzheimer's. But drama capitalizes on that creativity and on spontaneity to unlock feelings and thoughts and behaviors to further self-expression and self-awareness. People have an inherent desire to feel purposeful to be actively involved in life and to connect to others. Well, drama therapy utilizes many methods, including music and art movement and uh, uh, music and dance. I'll describe one of the primary tools we use, improvisation. And through improvisation, people develop stories and they take on roles. These two elements are what I'll focus on. Stories allow a person some safe distance from talking about painful or inaccessible subjects. The plots they develop, the characters they create, the settings, the timing, the conflicts that become part of the story in their original stories, these can serve as a kind of Rorschach bringing up truths that have significance to the person emotionally and cognitively. And then the therapist guides the participant to discover those truths and to find out their significance. Now, role can widen the vistas 
and let a person try on behaviors and aspects of personality that are not part of his usual repertoire uh, or comfort zone. Here's an example. A man in his early 80s with Alzheimer's who participated in a drama therapy group took on the role of a dynamic and booming band leader in a parade fashioned after the music man character. Uh, this role was novel for him because he tended to be a passive, meek individual with difficulty being assertive. The role gave him a taste of feelings and behaviors that he actually enjoyed. He said he'd like to be more like that character in real life. And he actually tried to speak up for himself more following that, as was reported by his wife. Another example was very powerful. A woman in her upper 80s with Alzheimer's told a story about hiding with her parents for oh, well over a year when she was a young child, managing to escape capture by the Nazis in her town until they made it miraculously to a ship and crossed the Atlantic. Now group participants acted out her story at her request while the storyteller watched. She burst into song singing God bless America when the boat in the drama came into sight of the Statue of Liberty. This drama therapy participant later said she had never been able to tell that story before because it only brought up the nightmare reality of pain and fear and hunger. But this time it brought up gratitude and love and hope. I hope these examples help really illustrate the power of the access to emotions and thoughts that can make change for people. Group work allows the participants to interact, stimulate responses in other people, and to experience being mirrored, heard, valued. Being right is not on the menu. For people with Alzheimer's, their own reality in the moment is reality. Knowing the year, the day, the time, or the name of the president just isn't important. What is important is the person, his, her feeling known, seen, heard, felt, valued. I would like to show you one picture to capture a bit of drama in action. And to share with you some quotes from participants in the creative arts therapies because their words, words speak all that we need to hear. I do not care about anything else. Art is giving me a world where I can create out of my own dreams, where I am, who I am, a client following an art therapy session. Another client after expressive therapy said, my mind is working like I never knew it could. I thought it was dead. A third person, I do not know what's going on, but it seems Alzheimer's stops where creativity begins. And when I sing, play music, dance and paint, I not only am this old, I'm not only this old person who has dementia, I'm not sure anymore if the doctors did not make a mistake with my diagnosis. And finally, who cares about the body when I can feel my spirit is alive? I think those past participants in creative arts therapy and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds more all over the world who've experienced the changes that the arts can bring. Uh, those speak more, the most eloquently of all. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Judy. That was wonderful. And now Angel Duncan, who many of you heard recently when she was invited to speak to your group, um, is going, is, well, Angel, as we said before, is Director of Graduate Art Therapy and Counseling at Alberta Zach Magnus College. And she, if she'd like to, would, can tell you a little bit more of what she's done. But um, she's going to share her thoughts with us now, too. Thank you, Verna. Thank you so much, Judy Holstein, Judy Planet, Senior Planet. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, art is, you know, it's universal. It, it's, there's, it's just, it is, it's, it's a universal language when there's, you know, despite any memory or cognitive or developmental disabilities and or challenges. And I love Berna's movie, being in Alzheimer's research, working with pharmaceutical, and then being an art therapist and marriage and family therapist, the two really need each other. We need to find effective treatments for the disease, but we also need to nurture the spirit and the soul. And I love Berna's movie, that really exemplifies how the arts and sciences meet each other. And then Judy's work and everything she talked about with expressive arts is just, I have to just echo everything she said. And as an art therapist, museums, I feel really allow us to be able to integrate these individuals back into society in a dignified and meaningful way. We're not just warehousing them behind a locked door. We're bringing them back into society and doing dignified things and museums across the world have opened their doors and have allowed these individuals the opportunity to come in and create and say i'm still here and i still have something to contribute and i'm going to share i do a lot of museum and i do a lot of museum docent training throughout the country and um, recently I just started a new program at the Yale University Art Gallery called Arts and Minds for those that just got diagnosed. These are people with early onset or early stage or myocognitive impairment prodromal, MCI prodromal, um, who are I think one of the most vulnerable populations because I don't think they're being served in the way that they should be. So we've been doing some wonderful things at the gallery um, here at Yale. But the Meet Me at MoMA, I want to share this with you because Mary Middleman um, and Cynthia Epstein are at NYU, and I believe they're the first, to my knowledge, that did a study on the importance of museums and memory. And she did an abundance. She did probably way overkill of um, different types of diagnostic, evidence-based, validated scales. And she was able to prove and show that there were intellectual stimulation, conversations that were dignified, shared experiences happening. There was a social interaction, a social cohesion with groups. It was an accepting environment. There was no stigma, no shame, no judgment. There was an emotional carryover, meaning that people were leaving the museum feeling good. And those feel good feelings lasted throughout the day and even helped in some cases with people that were sundowning. People wanted to return. They were excited. They wanted to have the opportunity to come back. And most importantly, depression lessened, anxiety lessened, affect and mood improved. I had a, a woman just recently when we did our last group right before the pandemic and we had to close down for temporarily, I had a phone call from one of our couples who are in their 50s. And he's early onset and she said he lost all confidence and was shut down and didn't want to go in public. And we got the opportunity to come to the art gallery here, you know, at Yale, the University Art Gallery. And I found my husband again. I found his, his, he found his confidence again. He was able to contribute meaningful conversations and a discussion without being afraid. And it was just so rewarding to hear how we're providing opportunity again. These are just some experiences, you know, this is at the Newark Museum. The Star Ledger did a, did a whole um, segment on the front page paper of the work that we did at the Newark Museum. This was in Naples at uh, the Von Liebig. We have musicians that volunteer their time and they, what we do is I'll introduce a piece of the art and we'll talk about it in a group discussion and then the musicians will play a piece that they think matches the artwork. And then it gets more conversation going. And as Judy was talking about earlier, we're doing a whole blending of these expressive arts. We're using art, 
we're using music and then we're, people are getting up and dancing. We're doing dance movements. And it's a wonderful shared, joyful experience for, for, for all of us. These are just other examples of some of the musicians that have come from the Philharmonic. Um, the Artist Naples Gallery, the Von Liebig, the bottom picture is This Is Us at Yale at the University Art Gallery. And one of the things I found interesting was the picture on the top right. I was talking with a physician, a neurologist, and he asked me which one had the diagnosis. And I thought that was a really peculiar question to ask because I thought, who cares? What I appreciate is that these are people that get to be husband and wives again. They're not a caregiver. They're a mother and a daughter, a son and a mother. They're, they're, they're relationships that get to bond and have these, these moments. I loved this one. Tom's thumb next to the green thumb. And he talked about how his wife was the gardener. He wasn't the gardener. So there's his thumb next to the green thumb. And as he was processing with me, he started talking about the actual types of plants that his wife planted. And then he put his arms around her and was like, she's the best thing in my life. I don't know what I would do without her love. And she was tearful. She was tearing up. And it was a moment that they got to share as a husband and a wife. This was a woman that was pretty shut down who was sparked. She had these memories that, that kind of get sparked and rekindled. And she sat in the studio, very quiet, and her husband was actually one of the, he was probably the one that was the most skeptical about the museum. This was in a Fort Myers, Florida. And he wasn't sure about it because he didn't know how well she would do or if she would even remember. And then she painted this. And I asked her about it and she said, this is Moorhead City, North Carolina. It's a favorite vacation spot with my husband. This is us fishing. This brings back so many happy memories. And she remembered that and that gave them an opportunity and something to reminisce and talk about. And in that moment, they were husband and wife having a shared moment of a favorite vacation spot. And I love this one. Andreas Frank is a photographer who, they sunk a, they sunk a battleship off Sanibel, which is 20 minutes from where I live. And he did, he put an underwater camera on the battleship to watch it erode over time. And then he did modeling and he did these kind of Titanic-ish underwater scenes when he photo emotioned these images and they're huge. And this one woman was quite taken by this, by this particular photograph. And this was the first one we showed. 45 minutes later, we went into the art studio and she was still remembering this picture. And by her memory, she painted the one on, this is what she painted. And she titled The Kiss because this reminded her of when the war ended and it was a famous picture of the, of the sailor grabbing the woman and kissing her. Um, that was just something that she resonated with and it had a lot of deep meaning for her. And the fact that she remembered this 45 minutes later and recreated that from her memory was quite impressive. Coming together, this is a woman who used to be in it. She used to play instruments and hadn't touched an instrument since her diagnosis. It had been like over 15 years. And it would just brought so much memories and happiness back to her. These programs provide so much opportunity that as Berna described in her film, um, we're capturing the memories, we're capturing the stories, we're, catching, we're capturing the spirit of these people. And as Judy eloquently said, you know, they may not know who the president is, they may not know the day of the week or the time, and that doesn't matter because that person is still there. And we have so much to learn from each other. And I feel like if physicians took the time to participate in programs like this, they would probably learn so much more information than they ever would have out of a book or an MRI or PET scan. So I really think that the arts and sciences need each other. I think we need more programs like this. I think that we need to lessen the use of psychotropic drugs to control behaviors and start using the arts um, and start looking at the arts seriously as effective treatment and medicine because, you know, the two, they go hand in hand. And I thank Verna for the opportunity to be a part of this. And I thank you all for taking the time and the interest to um, share in this collective cohesion of celebrating the human spirit and art. 
So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Angel. And now um, we'd like to ask you if you have any questions, you could post them on chat. But I also wanted to ask either uh, Wendy Miller or Mark Wortman if they had anything to add at this point, because um, Wendy has still been very active and uh, written a book recently about her work with her husband and, and started a big program at George Washington University. And uh, Mark, is, uh, as I said, so has been CEO of Alzheimer Disease International. Would either of you like to add anything at this point or should we just ask for questions? Can I say something? Yes. Sure, yeah, okay. Um, well, I've seen, I've been all around the world in uh, places where people with Alzheimer's live. And I've seen many examples of use, using the arts as a, arts and music as a tool to um, to help people and to give them a better life, better quality of life. And, and that's e actually very universal, even in Japan, for instance, or in South America, or here in Europe, or in India, in, in many, many places they use it. Um, one more thing to say is that um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the, the, what is called the finger study from Finland. It's a, this is a prevention study on uh, people who are, are at risk for Alzheimer's and they get an intervention of uh, this very holistic uh, medication, exercise, uh, brain training, um, all, all the good things you can do. Um, and it seems that this reduces your risk of Alzheimer's and dementia. And it's duplicated now in the US as well. As well. It's called the pointer study. But I'm, I'm involved in a project in Austria where they're going to do this as well. And they want to include art therapy as another uh, part of the, of the intervention. So we'll see if that makes a difference. And, and but the, because there is very little scientific evidence on the use of arts and what it does with people, but we all in this session we can see it, and, and from common sense you know that it's true. But there is little scientific evidence, to, so it would be good to build that up. Thank you, Mark. That was that was very important information. Um, Wendy, did did you want to add, add anything? Sure. Uh, I mean, it's just such a pleasure to, to be here and to hear all of you. It's very exciting. Verna keeps referring to my late husband, Gene Cohen, who <clears throat> is considered one of the founding fathers of the field of geriatric psychiatry and eventually also very, very involved in what is called creative aging. But when I think about Jean, and as Verna said, she has like a special bonus um, uh, section in the in when you get the film as a DVD you not only get to see I remember better when I paint but she also has three wonderful bonus um, films that are in it and so one of them uh, is an interview with my late husband but what I was going to say about him is that he um, started out at the National Institute of Mental Health and really was very, very active in helping the, the NIH develop an institute for aging. Because essentially what he said is you have all of these institutes and you're studying things like cancer and diabetes and Parkinson's and all these various diseases. And, but if you don't understand what goes on in natural aging, then you can't possibly understand you know, in other words, if you if you put aging and illness together, you can't understand what happens in natural aging. And went on from that to um, be very, very involved in the study of the brain and in the study of Alzheimer's. So I, I can't help but think about him as we're, you know, listening and looking at where the world is. And as um, Berna mentioned, I, he passed away in 2009 from a metastatic cancer. And he and I had been writing together and eventually after some years, 
um, I found the strength to go ahead and edit that work and um, publish a book called Sky Above Clouds, Finding Our Way Through Creativity, Aging, and Illness. So that book came out in 2016. And for these years since then, I have gone around the country, you know, sometimes in bookstores and libraries and cancer centers, but very often at, at conferences and done a number of presentations with the book. And one of the questions that I don't think I've ever done a presentation where someone doesn't say to me, you know, yeah, but you're talking about creativity with artists. Like, what about me? You know, I'm not an artist. And what about the person who's not an artist? And what about, you know, I don't think I'm good at it. And and it's so interesting to me to to realize that that no matter how old we are, there's that deep rooted sense of kind of, um, it's really a stigma, I guess you'd say, of you know the difference between who is creative and who isn't. So I think one of the things that's been very exciting today, listening to Judy and Angel and, um, and Berna, and also um, the one that Angel did before, is the whole concept, and this is what Jean was really promoting, the concept that creativity is not only about the arts, it's, it's actually a muscle that we have. It's something that we need to call forth. And not only is it something that we need to call forth, but it's something that developmentally does change as we age. So as I've been going around with my book, I've also been looking at, you know, new research that comes out because, um, Gene's also known for a very large creativity and aging study that he did um, through the National Endowment for the Arts. So recently, the National Endowment for the Arts started hiring art therapists. They have nine to 11 art therapists who they are using now. I find that phenomenal. And as an artist and also an art therapist, I, I was always bothered by that distinction between who's the art therapist and who's the artist. And one of the things that I found out is that they really didn't fund or bring in art therapists for a really long time because they didn't think they had the skill, i.e. that integration that Angel is talking about between science and art. They felt like we have the skill in the arts, but we don't really have the skill in the sciences or in medicine to be able to understand art therapy. And recently that has changed. So that's a really important, if you think about the, the essence of what that means, that's so important. And then just last year in 2019, you know, you can find articles from Canada, for instance, where they are prescribing what Angel was showing, bringing people to museums to look at art. They are actually, doctors have on their prescription pads, they give people that prescription, you must go to the art museum three times this month. And of course, what they found out is that all of the things that have been mentioned, you know, less anxiety, less depression. The one from um, Canada actually looks at less loneliness. So, I mean, we are definitely moving in this direction. Why it takes so long is beyond, I don't even know how to understand that. I mean, Gene always used to talk about the phrase that he would use is, you know, if this were a pharmaceutical company that had the results that we all have from what goes on with art as an intervention, you know, Medicare would be prescribing it. Wendy, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. Thank you for, for sharing all your information and sharing the wonderful things that Jean has, has done and you've done together. I, I wanted to follow up on the museums because um, Carolyn Halp and Healy, who started uh, a group with uh, Jamie Noble, Dr. Jamie Noble of Columbia University, has a group called Arts and Minds in New York, and they um, also are mentoring the Smithsonian CME group in, in Washington, D.C. So as Wendy mentioned, all over there are 
museum groups that really started with the Meet Me at MoMA through the Museum of Modern Art are all over the United States mentoring and helping people with memory impairment and getting them to go to museums. And now with the lockdown, there's virtual programs. I attended one the other day through the, um, through the, uh, through the Arts and Minds group at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. So it's, it's just a wonderful thing that has happened. Anyway, I'm not sure that I see any um, questions, but would anybody else like to add anything? Or does anybody have anything that they want to share um, on this topic or any other thoughts? Well, I just wanted to let you know, uh, first of all, thank you so much for this information. It's just so, so interesting and inspiring. Uh, I don't know if you realize that um, Senior Planet is in New York is so connected with MoMA. So they do a tremendous amount there. I think even um, right. our, our robot took a tour uh, through the museum as well, um, operated by one of the Senior Planet members. Uh, so it is it is a real close connection and something that's really important to Senior Planet um, as well. And, and we have five impact areas and creative expression is one of those. Um, the one question I have is, and I know, you know some of you have traveled all over the world. So Frank Van Dillen was the architect, one of the architects at Dementia Village in Hookebeck. And, and their model of, if any of you haven't um, seen this, it's sort of a, almost like an inside out world for, um, uh, advanced dementia patients uh, who are really living in a lovely little town environment instead of a, an, a facility or institutional style environment. And I was wondering if any of you knew if they had uh, significant program, uh, art programs there. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's it's in my country, so and I've been there several times. Yes, they do. They have a they have a full program. They even have a theater in this little village. So uh, it's everybody lives in a small scale house. I think with eight people together in one unit, and they can and then the streets outside where they can go to the supermarket, to the theater, to the uh, to get a haircut, to the, to the gym. Uh, and they have a full arts program as well during the week, including painting and, and other, other stuff. I have a great interview with Frank and, um, about uh, and a tour of the village, so I'll try to include that in my follow-up email uh, to everyone. Uh, if you'd like to get the follow-up email with the recording and uh, you're not a Senior Planet member, throw your email into the chat and I'll be sure to send you that when we follow up. Anybody else have any comments or? Oh, I, ju I just wanted to add that Mark also introduced us into to Christian Engelbert and we have a, a, a film bonus on him. Um, he's in, in Brussels and they have uh, residences, uh, special villages too, I think, Mark. And I also wanted to thank David Troxell because it's really through David who's written the books and done events that called Best Friends who introduced me through another friend to, to Judy, so thank you. Um, yeah, and actually I have a great interview with Virginia Bell who works with okay. David on oh, Best great. Friends. Um, she did an extraordinary interview okay. with us. So yeah, so it's really a, a great, um, a, a lot of fabulous people uh, who are doing wonderful work. Oh good, I'm starting to get some email addresses. So, so this is absolutely fabulous. So if, oh, oh, go ahead, Roberta. Do you have your hand up? Let me take you off mute. Oh, right, thank you. Um, I'm, Bravo to all of you. I think this is so marvelous. Uh, and I'm just waiting for uh, Big Pharma to get lost and Big Therapy, Arts Therapy, to take over where Pharma needs to disappear to and for Medicare to take over the support of it. But I'm wondering about uh, extending um, this therapy to other people those with other neurological diseases, particularly Parkinson's, 
and to the population in general. Why should you need to be diagnosed with uh, something as horrible as Alzheimer's to benefit from the stimulation of artistic endeavors? And I would throw into that pot also exercise. Uh, that's the one thing that is being done for uh, Parkinson's patients. And um, I teach a class, uh, an exercise class to Parkinson's patients, and it's absolutely amazing what it does. What we're, it just brings them back to fullness and to um, ability and control over their bodies and um, over their minds as well. So I'd love to hear the, some comments from the professionals on how this could be expanded if it hasn't already. There is, there is, um, I actually work a lot with Parkinson and there are a lot of different programs available. There is also starting to become more programs for persons with Lewy body dementia. We're seeing a lot more increase of Lewy body as well. TBI, traumatic brain injury. Um, there was just recent um, episode even with chronic migraine. So a lot of the neurological sciences are definitely looking at the arts more closely. And it is great to see that there is more programs. It's not at the level I probably think you and I would want to see it at, but there is, there is, it's getting there, but there are programs available. And I'm happy to share that with you. Well, I, I know that the program that we run in Paris, we do it with people with autism and other um, debilitating diseases. So I, I think it's it's very much um, in the works and and is happening and you're absolutely right, Roberta. Uh, thank you, Roberta, for those uh, that question. Hi, this is my sister, and I'm thrilled to see her this way. We'll have to zoom more often, Roberta. Uh, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the when you speak of the program being available for uh, other people, uh, not limited just to Alzheimer's. Perhaps you mean the museum programs of, of Art Encounter. And if, if so, absolutely, I, I agree that all kinds of people should be able to go to similar museum programs and encounter art as they um, have been very successfully doing now for people with Alzheimer's. But as far as all of the creative arts therapies being used for all kinds of people of all ages, from very, very young children all the way to past 100 years of age. That has been going on for a long time in each one of the modalities. And I mentioned ITA, that just happens to be in the Chicago area, uh, the only comprehensive uh, organization, uh, Institute for Therapy Through the Arts, that does use all four of the creative arts therapies with people of all ages, with all needs, physical, cognitive, emotional needs. So yeah, uh, the therapies are used with a lot of people, not as widely available as the pharmacies would make things available at the drugstore. You're right. Well, thank you. If we, if we um, were making, so is there the type of art classes to so say you don't have any diagnosis and are there the types of art classes where there's some type of therapy I don't know really what I'm saying here <laughs> but included in other words instead of just learning the creative means whatever you're learning whatever media you're using are, are there things structured where it is uh, more in depth where it's talking about issues or, or, or enhancing the, the brain or the use of the brain or anything like that. So I'm, I'm just, I'm asking a question. I have no idea what I'm exactly saying. <laughs> I have an impulse to jump in right away. And I'd like to hear also from Angel. Uh, the, we do need to be careful about expertise, training, professional credentialing. And an art therapist is highly trained to use arts therapeutically with people. That's different because of the intention. 
the intention is to use it as therapy and then to know how and to know what to do with it when things get opened up and the person starts responding in terms of a therapeutic response. Uh, same with drama and dance movement and music. There's a tremendous amount of training that is required and rightfully so. So to say that art or dance or music or drama can be therapeutic, that is true for probably every chance that people encounter it. Anytime you do some art making of any kind, it is therapeutic. It's calming, it's exciting, it's stimulating, it's those are things that are therapeutic. But that is not the same as intentional use of these modalities by a professional for therapy. So um, thank you, Judy. People have been posting um, programs that exist. One at the University of Colorado Medical, Medical Center has a free art therapy class for cancer patients. And Mark Wortman says there is a, a program, the HERE, and meaning in Amsterdam, for people with dementia, autism, depression, and other issues. Um, so I think if we explore, we probably find a lot of programs. Um, Judy, I didn't know if we were going over our time. Is, is that, are we yes, okay? That's, that's quite all right. Anyone who needs to pop off can go ahead and pop off. So they, they, they typically know that. Oh, good. Does, does anybody want to add anything else or does anybody else have a question or want to comment or anything like that? Are we? Angel, uh, did you want to follow up on what I said by any chance? And you literally took the words out of my mouth. Oh. I, I couldn't have said it any better. You, you said exactly what I would have said. <laughs> yeah. We've all been working together, so. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Jermaine. 15 years ago, I organized a senior theater group here in Laramie, Wyoming, a community theater, all of aging population, and it has been the greatest resource. I did some um, study at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque several years ago on improvisation. We have found that those, we have a membership of around 70, all over the age of 55 to 60 to 80 to 90 in this group. We put on productions for the community. The memorization, the stimulation, we do have the advantage of the University of Wyoming Theater Department that has been very, very helpful. So I've been, of course, I'm one of these people. I couldn't, I can't draw a straight line with a ruler. But, but as far as stimulating the brain, I think this is one avenue that somebody says, well, I really don't have that skill level to draw or to dance or to play an instrument. It's still out there. And I know senior theater is very big in, in Colorado. I've been introduced to that there. So it's, it's through um, senior uh, source. And Bonnie Broomberg in uh, Portland is the one that I worked with initially. It's a great avenue of stimulation for people of our generation. Great. Thank you, um, Jermaine. Does anybody else want to show you? Judy, you were going to say something, I think. Judy, yeah, Roberts. Roberta, when your mom started to paint again, did that bring back memories of her other types of, you know, her original painting skill? And did she get frustrated at all by that? Or was she just in the moment with the painting at the time? Well, she really, so this uh, painting on the cover of the DVD and of the book um, is a copy of a painting that she had done about 30 or 40 years prior, except you can see that some of the boats are in the sky. So she did have memory, she did have muscle memory, but she didn't, it took her a very, very long time to start painting again. And Jenny, who was the first person who painted with her, um, finally couldn't get her to paint. She wasn't interested. She wasn't interested. And then Jenny pretended that my mother was the teacher and Jenny was the student. And then she was instructing Jenny and that's how she started painting again. So it did take a long time, but, um, but she did have similar, I don't know if I've answered your question, but she did have similar pieces that she was doing, but they were really happy pieces. Um, we, 
I, I have a whole gallery of paintings, but um, they're, they're all very um, colorful. And I mean, some are darker than others, but they're mostly colorful with boats or flowers or things. Yeah. Wonderful. Did I answer your question? All right. Well, yeah. in a way, yes. That, well, you know, she, like you said, she did have that muscle memory. So there was some recall of, of the, this talent, I guess, and the skill she had had before or the, or the content. Well, Judy and Berna, um, isn't it true, Berna, that your mother was commissioned by, I believe, the Navy? Yes, the Navy Department. Uh -huh. To paint the whole fleet of the U.S. Navy in what year? 1933 for the Chicago World's Fair. Right. Yeah. Wow. So those paintings were very prominent, important, and they were ships. And so as Berna showed on the cover of the, movie, of the film, it's one of her paintings, very reminiscent of the ships that were important in her earlier. So I, I think you were on something, Judy, and she did. Yeah, definitely. Yes, very true, Judy. Thank you, Judy's. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is so interesting. Anybody else have a comment or question? This is Lois. I'm trying to get myself here. Hi, Lois. Go ahead. Well, I, I was thinking when I was uh, doing a practicum at the University of Minnesota, I, worked, I, I was involved with a drama group, and our art uh, uh, drama coach, well, we had a, a class called Creative Dramatics It was and Storytelling, and that was in the 60s, and, and it was very similar. You talk about different age groups, it's, it, but it, was, it brought out the children in, in this community center, and I always remember little Verna, <laughs> and she was kind of a kind of a bully little girl, but she wanted to be Cinderella, and then the frailest little girl that that wanted to be the giant from Jack and the Beanstalk, and it was it kind of gave them a like like a part of their personality that they could be someone else, and I I was that was very interesting. They were just uh, I think eight eight years old or something like that. It was very interesting experience because they wanted to be who they weren't and it kind of freed them from their, their selves, I think. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anybody else? Uh, Dan, I noticed you joined late. Um, so I just wanted to tell you if you're interested in getting the recording, uh, you can put your, uh, email in the chat and so you can hear what the whole presentation was. Thank you. No other comments or questions? Well, again, this I can't phenomenal. give you enough. This absolutely. Wonderful. So inspiring. I mean, I cannot yes. believe. And I'm going to forward, you, you say we will all get the recording, Judy? Uh, yes, yes. So okay. give everybody the recording. We'll get to our group. Just yes, to share it. it, to share, share it with it. other people. And, yes, and I, I'll also include, um, you know, everybody's information. So Judy and uh, Berna, I mean, I have a lot of yours, but if there's anything else you want and angels, um, you know, if you want me to share any information, websites or anything like that, I'll include it in the email. Okay. So you okay. can just shoot me an email with it or, or however you want to communicate that. Um, thank you all. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. And I want to say Jermaine's background really adds to this whole experience. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, well you, you know, I always said my Sunday. Mother, I really love this program today. And I've been involved in drama when I was in high school, when I was in college. You know, I used to say it, if I ever came up missing, check Hollywood. But it never worked. <laughs> Anyway, okay, I, I, let's, I, let's thank I, Judy I, for putting this together. Love, thank you so much. Somebody You're I'm so on. welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you. Have a lovely day. And uh, yeah. tomorrow we're thank playing you. a game. So it'll okay. be a pleasing. Thank I'm looking forward that. to it. Thank you all. <laughs> it was just so <laughs> inspiring. Thank you. Okay, thank you. bye, everyone. Thank have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Mark, Wendy, too. Thank you.